Hi. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the first of the series of the John H. James Reading Series here at Benham Martin Public Library. My name is Vicki Pike and I'm the Assistant Curator here in the Heritage Room. And I'd like to mention that the Heritage Room is dedicated to Nebraska authors and anybody related to Nebraska. And I'd like to invite you to come up and visit our collection anytime you'd like to. We're open from uh, Tuesday, through 30, Thursday, Tuesday through Friday, 12.30 to 3 in the afternoon. I'd like to introduce to you tonight our guest speaker, Stephen Barrett, who's an English professor at UNL. He's been there since 1980. Recently, he's been honored with the 1990 Annis Chaikin Sorensen Award for Distinguished Teaching in Humanities. Congratulations on that. Uh, his specialties include British Romanticism, especially Blake, Shelley, Mary Shelley, and Wordsworth, as well as later 18th century and comparative literature. Mr. Barron has published uh, extensively, in particular, many works of poetry, which he'll be sharing with us tonight. And besides his current publication, Shelley and his audiences, which we do have here in our collection, he has an upcoming work about to be published uh, due out next year on William Blake. So with that, let's introduce Stephen Barron. Thanks very much. It's always exciting to be the first person in a series to sort of run the risk of sinking the ship before it gets out of the dock. Um, I want to share a kind of a variety of things with you tonight. It's sort of an eclectic bunch of things. I timed it earlier. It ran just under four hours. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a wave or signal or something if you can't hear me, if my voice peters out, if you can't stand anymore, whatever. Um, since the weather cleared up right on schedule, I thought I'd give you a couple of garden poems to begin with. The first one is called The Backyard Farmer. I wonder where I got that title. When you set up plants in Nebraska, you take your chances. Heat, drought, floods from above, and from salty river courses. If you're lucky, the aphids burn up, and the cabbage moths go elsewhere, and no tree falls on your garden, and no tornado moves your porch there. So you weed and water, fretting about mulch and mold and leaf rust. And tomatoes swell and redden, flattening their scarlet weight into the, into the meager shade of curling leaves. Purple eggplants darken, glowing beside peppers as green and red as midwinter holly berries. We devour the tomatoes, sweet and warm from the vines. Roast and oil peppers of all colors revel in the juices of this bounty and try to ignore that they've cost us sweat and worry, gray hairs, and seven dollars a pound. <laughs> another tomato poem, another garden poem. This again, I think, is one of the pitfalls of Nebraska gardening. It's called False Alarm. It's the evening before the freeze, and I study the garden from the back porch. The tomatoes haven't finished yet, nor the peppers and eggplants. They still sport blossoms and small fruit, though the October days deny them heat to fuel and fill these stragglers. So they must go unfulfilled, for tonight they freeze. That simple fact must work its way. I do not cover and mulch, mulch, nor spray, nor stoke smoky fires all night to save a salad, no matter how exotic. I take shears and colanders in hand and clip peppers whose bottoms are barely red, twist off tomatoes small and tough-skinned. I wash them carefully in the kitchen and cover the tables in the dark back room. Now an early darkness wraps the garden while clouds roll in and unexpected rain sweeps up from the south. The temperature rises. There is no frost. I wake to a damp, gray morning that ushers in two weeks of warm. The vines and pillaged plants rise before me like accusers. Forcibly denuded, they shame me now and my haste with branches bare before their time. In two weeks, when the freeze does come, I have already stripped the plants and turned the soil. Then I find them in the back room, peppers, sweet and ripened, firm and scarlet among tomatoes sharp and dense, their acid juices concentrated like the sun of Indian summer that found them nevertheless, that touched them with its own silent motions as the season waned. As you can tell, 
get into gardening a little bit. It's a good thing my wife isn't here because she's the real gardener who reminds me that I never weed a bloody thing. <laughs> but I want to eat all the stuff, of course. So here's another garden poem. This one's called The Mammoth Tooth from the Garden. It lies there on the kitchen table, stark, silent, shedding black dirt as it dries on last night's newspaper, banded round like some strange compressed spring, flat treaded, a fossilizing bit of yellowed tire. There on one side now, the jagged yellow streak where my spade struck it deep in the earth. I was simply planting a tree, not seeking treasure. There, beneath the tulips all these years, beneath the flaming heads coming every spring, passing already as the second warmth would grow each year, it lay, silent, secret, cold in its long refuge from past and present, from its world and mine. I pulled it roughly from my way, thinking rock, perhaps root, never suspecting. How does one imagine such a thing beneath the yard where one cultivates grass and perennials, takes the sun, reads poetry and history? Now I feel its edges, rounded from the grinding, dyed by tannin, by the hours that grew to centuries before I interrupted, before I let time intrude on timelessness, on dark forever. Here, with my warm coffee, my fire to ward off the fall, I wonder what I shall do with it mantle, my desk, a dark box in the cellar. Here, now, at this glaring spot of time, of time that presses, that surrounds from clocks and calendars, lists of appointments I must keep tomorrow, I touch it carefully, with finger and with eye, as if the drying grains that fall from it in the warmth were part of it, were its husk, its place, falling away to powder in my kitchen. How strange this relic on my table, hiding on the printed page the account of a killing, news from somebody's war, somebody's famine. How out of place, this part suggesting the whole. For if a tooth slept there in the dark earth, has risen to meet me as I invaded its place, what else must remain? What more beneath, beside? What great sleeping yellow spirit? Some of you know the story of that poem. Uh, one of my colleagues in the department with whom I occasionally exchange poems, I gave him this, this one, and he came to me the next day and said, can I see it? Will you bring it here? And, you know, artists are all liars. There is no mammoth tooth. And I felt very bad. <laughs> so it goes. Uh, I should tell you a little bit, I suppose, about myself to relieve you from listening to this stuff. Um, I come from northern Wisconsin, and uh, my mother's family were in the monument business. They were an old French transplanted family. So I spent a lot of time hanging around cemeteries. I suppose that makes me part of the graveyard school of poetry. But uh, as, a, as a young kid, I spent a lot of time hanging out in cemeteries, uh, helping the stone crews set the monuments and that sort of thing, wandering around back, yard, uh, back roads. And uh, this next poem comes out of that. It's, it's for a grandfather who, in fact, had died long before I was born. It's called The Stone Man. I never knew him, this grandfather who stares off to the right from a single fading photograph, stiff, formal, prematurely balding like his son and his son's sons. The other side of the family, the stone workers. From, from the ravages of Verdun, he brought his strong French blood to his brother's granite works. In their sway-backed cutting shed, he sliced and shaped with them raw granite blocks with band saws, cold chisels, and the blood that darkened slabs that gouged and tore their flesh, that flattened fingers and shattered sturdy white ash dollies. He died of silicosis. Stonecutter's disease rendered him in stone. They worked the granite dry for want of costly water jets, lungs and blood and tissue stiffening with the stone dust they absorbed. The brothers breathing hard and deep of the clouds that shrouded them, that whitened beards and crusted over where they mixed with sweat and blood. 
In the heat of Wisconsin summers, they gasped for air, heaving the slabs through the thick and swirling haze of powdered mica, feldspar, quartz, from barge to saw to polisher, fashioning monuments whose smooth and open faces gave them back their own, red and streaming. In the sharp, dry air of winter, they spat blood from lungs that rent and tore with every shallow breath. That March evening in 1937, he was reading when he coughed and bright blood flowed that could not be stanched. In a quarter hour, he had bled to death before his wife and children, and in four days was buried in earth his brothers softened with fires of broken timbers from the shop. They dug him up in 1941 exhumed him for insurance adjusters who still balked, disbelieving doctors' claims that men could turn to stone. The pried-off coffin lid, lid disclosed him as he was in life, unchanged, gazing from a stony silence as he does now, looking off at something unseen, outside the frame of this worn and browning image that haunts me from the wall. I suppose it's everybody's dream to make the Norton Anthology, to be footnoted <laughs> incorrectly. Philosophical poetry. <clears throat> I should write philosophical poetry. Other poets do, it seems to me, well-praised ones who roll big questions, capital, capital, about, like so many kittens battering so many yarn balls, pale blue spheres unwinding silently among chair legs, wooden claw feet, ideas that snarl and tangle the thoughts. They draw out broad abstractions like the tormented intestines of Saint Erasmus in language that moves like cargo crates loose and shifting in a sinking steamer's belly. <laughs> Profundity is the objective, the target at whose concentric rings like the pulsing eyes of parrots aim our arrows of mental desire. But all those rings are zeros, piled on zeros. Oh, I would love to write philosophy, do. But I should think, not like that. I would not draw it so, but hard and tactile, fiercely bright like the sun at noon in late October skies, like the variegated leaves fallen and raked, heaped and fired, dissolving in the acrid bonfires that smell the best toward Halloween, blazing in the frost-edged darkness that freezes out philosophy, that fills the senses rich and full, the lungs with autumn and the end of things in flame and pungency. And so I turn always from my great plan, from the big questions with names as big, and quit the clouds of gray abstraction that cling like slo soaking flannel that weighs without warming. Leaves ablaze beneath b denuded boughs, the cries of geese falling from the darkened sky, the almost audible scratch of hoarfrost on the tall grasses, the coneflower leaves, the jack-o'-lanterns grinning and flickering on porch steps. These leave no room for philosophic poetry, there being too much life in all these dyings, these endings without limit, without end. One of the things that happens to me, I think, in trying to work with poetry is that I get caught up with place names. I, I'm one of those people who loves place names or odd person names. I'm intrigued to get a letter from somebody named Hilburn H. Womble. Um, <laughs> Many years ago, I was interviewed for a job by somebody whose name was Harbor Wind. I always thought it was wonderful, but I had a terrible time keeping a straight face. Uh, so I like looking around at places that have interesting place names. This is a poem that I wrote one day at a department, dare I say department, at one day at a meeting. <laughs> I like to write in meetings. It keeps me from screaming. It's called writer's block. The words dam up like poles of Norway pine floated down from Pembine and Wasaki that block the tannin-steeped Menominee. One has hung up somewhere, nosed into a washed-out bank and swung round, tail end yawing back to catch a boulder shouldering up from the current. 
Now others catch and twist, go sidelong, thrust sawed in skyward, dive beneath, build a thick and tangled mass of 24 foot rough barked lengths. The mill will send up a timberman with pike and iron bars to pry and prod the jumbled logs, to touch with experienced hands the spring that loads this chaos, that will release and free the jam explosively, mill hand jumping clear as always. Free, the logs will jostle around the bend, stretch out through the last six miles and fill the holding pond, lying quiet beneath the stars of the first frost night. The dredges and saws will address them in the morning light. The plains, shape boards, for, uh, shape boards still warm from the kilns to ready them for hands, for skills that build and smooth oil and wax, rub the surfaces warm and slick, and civilize what came downstream rude and wild, redolent of pitch and earth, of stream and sky. A cheery poem, the neighbor shot his children. The neighbor shot his children, three of them, one by one, at home on New Year's afternoon with the rifle that brought down rabbit and deer alike, small game and large, in the brown autumn fields that flank the silent eyeless plat. Their mother, flown to Florida to stroke and soothe a dying mother who will never see or know again her daughter or her daughter's children, does not know this, but imagines them rowdy and boisterous, or napping in birch paneled rooms with red hair pillowed, lustrous and uncombed, with long lashed eyelids flicking softly before swift concealed dreams. The neighbor drives his Ford Bronco, gun rack full behind his head, up a graveled county road to a foreclosed farm deserted on a hilltop, and, fearing pain, lowers the loaded rifle, gets out into the cold to plug the hot exhaust pipe with a russet deerskin glove, seats himself facing westward, and slips into his own unfeeling sunset as the bare horizon takes to rest the orange and bloody winter sun. Some letter writing poems, if you don't mind. This one's called Correspondence. I let the letters pile up, thinking I'll spend an evening writing, visualizing these people opening my letters, pleased to have found them in the mail, smiling at my wit, sitting down at once to respond, unable to wait, this posted conversation being so good, so honest, so fulfilling. <laughs> then evening arrives, and it's hot, and I'm tired from grading papers all day, and grumpy, shouting at the dogs and spilling tea all over my envelopes, and knocking pipe ashes on the pale carpeting. So I put it off, put some music on, stretch muscles so tense they make my joints squeak, my head draw down into my shoulders, and I fall asleep in my chair. Perhaps tomorrow, I tell myself when I wake at midnight, tomorrow will be an easier day. I can sit down right after supper when I'm fresh and the dogs are quiet and the breeze cool. I've told myself this lie for weeks and watched the stack of letters grow accusingly until just sorting through them occupies an evening. And I imagine all those people looking in their mailboxes for my letters, <laughs> pleased that I have not written, so that it is still my turn, not theirs. <laughs> Part of the problem is, of course, what they might find in their box. This is called letter. I write this to you for your eyes and mind, though you do not know me. I am a stranger to you, a visitor, guest perhaps, whom you entertain as you read these lines. By now, your now, the time in which you read, I am changed. Perhaps I am dead even. Older, certainly, and very unlike what I was even as I began to compose these lines. I have slipped into history, just as you are doing as you read, as you feel the subtle press of moments, the loss of what has fallen away beyond recall. Instance that may have held some small joy, some heart of violet, birdsong, 
whiff of new mown hay in September. Perhaps you smiled at some momentary thought, heard your lover's laughter from the next room. You might have been together had you not been here with me, reading us both into history, into the past we share. We lose ourselves at every step, in every line, like clouds dispersing and reforming. Others rebuild in history and in memory the selves we lose in living. You've been to readings that go on even longer than this one. I was telling one of my colleagues the other day about the experience of going to a concert. Two years ago, I think, they were playing Charles Ives' First Symphony. And I didn't know it was Charles Ives' First Symphony. I thought it would be you know, something later. Nobody plays the First Symphony for good reason. Well, they played it. And it's one of those things that no matter where they are in it, you can't tell where they are, and you can't get any sense of how close it's, you are to the end of it. So for hours and hours and several days, we sat there and they saw it happily away. And finally, it sort of stopped and people applauded politely. Well, this one is called the reading, as in poetry reading. There comes at last in these affairs that blue-black endless hour when the words go flat. When you think of poor old Southey hemming and hawking, pitching his voice in that note of woe that set clubfoot Byron's teeth on edge, and Peter's and Michael's, and it seems the air is filling up with yellow smoke. I can't breathe, for God's sake, someone cries in the roiling, wordy fog that bulges out the creaking panels of the room, stuffed, crammed with the heavy baggage like so many pillows, fat as hippos. Will it ever end? Will he ever stop? I wonder if someone put the cat out or if it's still burning. Anything to think on, to clench in the imagination like a rose stem while we try to ignore this thorn piercing our stiff upper lip, scratching like a phono needle across the grooves of our patients. What if he never quits? They'll find us in the spring when they unseal the room, dried out like figs, asphyxiated in our seats. <laughs> The voice trails on through the fading light, through the dense and choking fog, soft, gentle as flannel, and as gray. Foul play is not suspected, but authorities remain baffled by the presence of the dried figs. <laughs> This is, I think, the newest thing that I have tonight. Um, in a way, it's the newest and the oldest for reasons that will become clear, I think, as, as I read this. It's called Moving Target. It's happening again, as it always does. It's 3 a.m., and I'm pulling a U-Haul through a rain that falls in white streaks before the headlights. This is northern Kentucky, Cincinnati still an hour away to the north. WHAS spills from the speakers. Music, time checks, news on the hour to keep me awake, to keep me pointed down the narrowing channel of pavement. My wife sleeps, exhausted from the packing, the loading and clinging heat, the pounding head and overstretched muscles. She does not know this story, for I never tell it, though it replays endlessly. It is 20 years, almost exactly, and you are still there, walking toward the road in the dark. I see you again, leading the parade of your first litter across the shoulder. I see you coming, moving in steady, straight line, banded tails, blackened faces. I feel the weight of the trailer, four car tires, Perhaps 50 square inches of tread hold us on course toward you on the streaming, slickened highway. Lines and trajectories have no emotion. They are motion only. The consequences of their intersections, devoid of feeling and of spiritual weight, for they are hard and factual, geometric, arithmetic, cold. 
I feel you pass beneath the wheels, a bump as of a pothole, too slight to, make, to wake my wife. The trailer's tug, almost imperceptible, says its wheel has found you too. It happens in an instant. There can be no braking, no swerve. I curse the night, the rain. You, most of all, for your stupid animal folly, your straight line, nose down, paws moving smoothly, rhythmically. I curse as I have for 20 years because I still cannot miss you, because I still feel that light hit as I pass ever deeper into the dark, driving always in senseless reparation to ease a soul, half yours, half mine. This one actually comes from a real thing. Um, it happened in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1975, I believe. This is called For the Teenagers Who Stoned the Zoo Bear. It was uh, at that point one of the largest grizzlies in the country. Could you listen then, unmoved, to his sigh of resignation as he lay down to die, sinless? to resist no more beneath the dark hail of your stones? Could you hear the, dark, the deep, resonant striking of brick against broad back, great sides that swelled and shrank in anguish, in confusion, at the twilight sky raining down missiles, where apples, where candy, and the warm spring rains had showered him? Could you watch the deep, the hopeless eyes, helpless to comprehend, to believe he was not to perform yet this once more, not to beg, even as you stoned him, as you killed him slowly for your amusement, brutally in the hushed green park? Could you live so, to find in this massive life some soulless thing, some mere trifle for your whim, your entertainment in its extinguishing? You who were dead long before he died, long before he lay his battered head on the cold, the waiting bloody concrete, a trickle of bright blood from his dark quivering nostril tracing the ebb of his great spirit among the waste of rocks and bricks, the shattered glass and flagstones, the fragments of the paved and ordered world made filthy by your civil touch. You could, of course, for you could laugh, for whom no toll might be too great, nor stone too heavy for laughter, for mirth, for murder, in the soft spring sunset, among the infected elms, the willows weeping with shame, with shame. I suppose the other great sin of my life is being somebody who li loves to fish but doesn't particularly enjoy eating fish. My wife won't have them at all. We occasionally try to do the good thing. You know, eat some fish, it's good for you. We both find that you take a mouthful of fish and it seems to get bigger in your mouth. Or invariably, I don't care how many times the fillet has itself been filleted, it's full of bones. And it gets bigger still, you know, and you grab for the bread and there's no bread left. <clears throat> this one is called the hook scar and the bass. I don't recall which finger it was where the fish hook jabbed in past the barb, point scraping on the bone. Smallmouth bass, cold and bronze, thrashing on the lazy ike, driving the hook on further, deeper. Second set of tra trebles flailing, nicking flesh and hand alike. I remember vividly the fish, though, in the nearly dark September night, and how I deliberated keeping it for revenge, or freeing it to get it off my hand. Now I can't remember which I did. It was 15 years ago, and yet I see that fish and feel the dull, peculiar scrape of the hook point. In the cabin, hook still buried in my finger, our friends brought out the hook extractor, designed for easy, painless hook removal. <laughs> mm -hmm. Slid it down along the hook, into the flesh, rotated it, twisted and tugged and tugged. I drank a shot of bourbon since everybody looked pretty shaken at the bloody finger. 
and the hook that refused to pull free. At last, success. Bent hook, torn finger, crazy ride on dark and twisting county roads to hospital and tetanus shot. Now I look at both hands in turn, and I'm not entirely sure which finger, nor do I even recognize the scar. I wish I could at least recall if I kept the fish. I hope I ate it. I want to read you a poem that has a sort of relationship to this reading, because I came to a reading gosh, two or three years ago in this room, and the weather was not quite as good as tonight. It was still raining when we all left. There was something strange in the atmosphere that night because I got uh, KDKA from Pittsburgh, clear as a bell, on the car radio and used up half a tank of gas because what they were talking about was so interesting and drove around in the rain. Well, naturally, I had to lie about the whole thing and what I was listening to, so here's a lie called elegy. Driving at night, late, beneath the electric stars of lights that line the civil ways, I listen to string concerti that pass soundless through the air to pour from speakers that flank me in the darkness. But these minor key baroque slow movements unsettle, disturb the easy peace with their tones of mourning, of cortege, and slow pain ceremony of parting. I would not be among a crowd now, but prefer this corridor of easeful sound. Some losses lie too near for music and for the visions that haunt these warm adagios. Have I lived too long then? I've seen flamingos thrown dead in a bright, unmoving heap, delicate reeds of legs shattered by fence pickets in the night. Great, soft, snowy pelicans with impertinent eyes, their bills sawed and broken under cover of dark. Bears and foxes lurching in the endless black, eyes struck blind with pointed sticks. Do the dead know pain after death? Does it follow them, wrap them in some other world like Creusa's rich embroidered robe? Or is this all, and do we dissipate like smoke rising in an empty Aryan sky, like music that hangs, then goes when the bows cease stroking, the strings rest? I see the deer young white-tailed does and fawns whose spots have not yet fully faded, lying sidelong and bent against the fence, great brown eyes open and staring, as though they tasted too late the poison in the bread. Do the dead weep, or is the dying but the final act of that dark and terrible drama, the breaking of the dream, the dawn? As you can tell, one of my things is a sort of an ongoing moral outrage at what people do to zoo animals. Before I read this one, I want to thank you all for coming out. This is very flattering. Um, I think everybody who does readings lives in horror of the empty room. On the other hand, occasionally only one person comes and the two people go off and drink beer. <laughs> This is, as I say, something of a Nebraska poem. Partly it stems from looking at pictures. You all know the kinds of pictures, the Solomon Butcher pictures, the, the things that show up in the archives, those pictures they used to run. I'm not sure if they still do just before they close down the public TV. Those incredibly hard, tough-looking people who somehow have those great, dark, staring eyes. So this is my Nebraska poem, and I'm very, very happy to say that I managed not to come even close to something that sounds like Husker in this. This is called Second Sun. <clears throat> when the second sun dies, sweaty and delirious, shaking with fever from heat and bad water, they have to stop to bury him. The heat, too great to bear him along. And so they toil, the three of them, beneath the white and shadeless sky. Father, 
eldest son, youngest, chopping through thick prairie sod with hickory shafted axes, prying out great blocks of deep matted turf like outsized paving stones from the St. Louis streets that lie behind them, piling them carefully. The women, second three, sew a winding sheet from their precious store of linen, thick and supple fabric of the old country, fabric of generations, of feasts and celebrations, folded with care for this journey, this passage in the leather-strapped trunk, and brought out now to serve this one time more, to warm him and hold him in this strange land's bosom, to soil and stain in the acid black earth toward which the men dig through sod and sand, silent, their salt sweat streaming. They spare a board from the wagon rail, forgetting in their grief that the south-facing sh side should best stay whole against the humid winds that rise, that sweep up hot from the southwest, from deep in ancient Anasazi lands, where other suns lie buried in the air. The youngest son, too young to dig long, hands bleeding from the effort beyond his strength, his years, bites his lip and brings blood, wincing in silence with the resinous fire of the oil he rubs into the cut board as he smooths it slowly with his raw and bloody hands. They will fashion it into a rough cross, scored with his name, with their love, rub carbon from the lantern chimney into the grooves, wax them to seal his name so neither wind nor sun shall steal it, face it eastward to catch the morning sun in early spring before the prairie grass engulfs it, as now the soil engulfs the white-wrapped boy, as now the blocks of sod safeguard against animals, conceal the dark earth they cover once again as now the distance steals it from their view while they move away westward, silent. Too little time, too little food, the land too vast to grant them rest, no more than these few prayers, these silent tears, this small cross smoothed with oil and blood that will perish in the August prairie fire that will cleanse this land, refresh it to bring forth new life. Thank you very much for coming.